our third speaker uh, for this session, Steve Karasik. So Steve was born in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, he has his uh, BS in civil engineering. He immigrated here to the U.S. in 1981. He has worked uh, in concrete forming and shoring uh, industry for 37 years. He's been with Perry Form Work Systems for 33 years. Steve worked on more than 500 projects involving office buildings, parking garages, wastewater treatment plants, lock and dams, bridges, etc. Some projects uh, that he's worked on that you may be familiar with, uh, the JFK Airport International Terminal Traffic Control Tower, the Pentagon reconstruction after 9-11, and this project we're talking about, the Kennedy Center expansion of the REACH. Please welcome Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Karasik. I work for Perry Formox Systems. I was uh, part of a very large engineering team that would design, support, and supply formwork for this project, for this very unusual project. And we did really require a large engineering team to do it. And it mostly has to do with two uh, issues on this project. One is uh, loads associated with uh, concrete uh, uh, placing pressure on our forms and geometry. The combination of loads and geometry created a very, very large project and challenges for the forming of this project. And uh, just to give you an, you know, uh, an example of a typical formwork projects that all formwork suppliers deal with is usually a rectangular shaped building, maybe occasionally a round building. And for all of this, we have only one problem, either uh, significant pore pressure or geometry. So it never, almost never happens uh, both. Both never happen, geometry and pore pressure. And because of those issues, we had spent a huge amount of time that I will talk about a little bit later on design and supply of these forms. So the best way to talk about forming issues is going through the different structures on this project. Okay, the first I'm gonna be talking about the vaulted slabs uh, of uh, entry pavilion, which is now called wel welcome pavilion. It's essentially a slab that uh, twists from vertical to horizontal um, orientation. Then the second I will talk about vaulted slab of, of um, we uh, welcome pavilion that is of a shape of a trumpet. And we keep giving the nickname of those little structures because they do look like a trumpet. Uh, the third uh, part is the vaulted slab on the river pavilion, which is a, a cone shape, or I would say a quarter shaped cone, also uh, challenging uh, forming and shoring. And uh, the fourth one is vaulted slab at Skylight or Events Pavilion, which is uh, similar to the, the number one that is essentially a slab slash wall that transitions from vertical to horizontal. Like I said before, most of the project we deal with is either vertical or horizontal, but almost never at the same time vertical and horizontal. Uh, and the fifth is the river pavilion wall, uh, which is kind of a mini-me of the last one, which is a skylight or events pavilion, which everybody mentioned before is the Sunder wall, where I stop a little bit more, talk about a little bit more in detail about the challenges associated with all of the previous ones that are going to be all, will all show up on the number six uh, Sunder wall. So first is the vaulted slab at the entry pavilion. It's uh, this slab right here that transitions from horizontal to vertical position. Um, this is uh, initial setup of the forms. You can see the concrete have not been poured yet. There is the plywood is visible in the rebar. And I will show you in a moment what's underneath the plywood, but this is the final product of the concrete. I believe this particular slab was cast in place up to a certain point, 
and then shot created in this area where it becomes uh, vertical or coming vertical. This is what you would see and we supply underneath that walled slab. If you look a little bit closely on this first picture from the bottom of that slab, what you see here is a panel right here. And those panels are all, almost all of them, no more than eight foot wide. And the reason they're eight foot wide is because they were assembled in our yard in Elkridge, Maryland, and we pre-assembled them and ship them on the truck, and the truck is eight foot wide. Occasionally, we had a little bit wider panels, but due to the cost constraints and design considerations, the most optimum size is eight foot wide panel. And length of the panel or height of the panel varies dramatically. On this uh, particular project, there was more than 200 panels, all different geometry. There was not one panel that was similar or identical. Uh, all of them individually designed. And that's why you see that this particular panel have a kind of triangular shape form. This particular panel have a different shape form. This particular panel even more different. And all of them coming from vertical to horizontal plane smoothly. Um, those panels are, are sitting on shoring or a horizontal platform that's supported by shoring. And those braces are bracing those forms and they're adjustable. So there was possibility for a fine adjustment of the form uh, of placing the forms. But, you know, make no mistakes. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's, adjustability is good. But uh, effort, huge amount of effort contractor placed in placing those forms in position, in the right position, was enormous because a little bit of deviation of location would immediately misalign all of the panels and then moving them uh, later on would be um, uh, very difficult, if not impossible. Down below, you can see example of the assembled panel. And as you can see, the shape of the plywood changes. And the way it allows it to change is because, you know, like Sarah told, we have uh, gussets uh, spaced usually 12 inches on center inside in, in both directions. And those gussets were cut, designed and cut by computer uh, with CNC machine and placed at the, at the exact locations to create a predictable shape. And as you know, whenever you do deal with uh, lumber or any kind of wood structures, it never is exact. Uh, there is always tolerances that are more than we would like to see. So a contractor would need to lane, would have to um, amend our forms occasionally uh, by the time it got to the job site. So next uh, part of the project or interesting structure is vaulted slab on top of the entry pavilion, uh, also known as a trumpet wall, bec uh, due to the fact that it's not a conical shape. It looks like a conical shape, but it's actually this line is flares down as you go a little bit um, uh, further away, uh, further west. And the problem with that is that uh, it's also elevated. So um, also problem is that it also imposes a load in such a direction that requires different um, um, uh, structures to keep this concrete in place without moving away from the existing structure. So you can, as you can see, this is a shoring. There is a little bit of platform that is part of the panel. This would be one panel. This would be another panel. It would be another panel, be another panel, and so on. So um, the difficulty of building it in installing it was apparent. We were moving very slowly, methodically, and with a lot of uh, different um, uh, corrections as we go about. And this picture kind of illustrates it. 
you have to work on the steep slope. At this point, the supply would have almost perpendicular to the horizontal uh, condition, and slowly it goes towards horizontal in the form of a trumpet until it goes to the very end, the point load in there. And this would be a rough example of the panel that we would place underneath the trumpet wall. Uh, I mean, each panel was marked and um, uh, still, even though it was computer generated and computer cut, we the people on the job site had to uh, adjust manually those panels. Another interesting uh, structure is vaulted slab on, on top of the river pavilion. It, similar to the trumpet wall, it was a little bit easier than the trumpet wall because the even though it was a quarter-shaped conical, it was not trump, trumpet shape. As you can see on this picture, this is nearly perfect uh, quarter circle. This is a this is a vertex of the co uh, cone, and this but this this piece is what what these forms right here are um, uh, supporting. And again, the, the same thing you see is a shoring supporting the panel and the panel itself sitting on the top of the shoring. There's a next panel and there's a next panel. And another is another water stop is at the Vance Pavilion. Uh, again, it's a kind of a mini me of entry pavilion wall where it's not quite coming from a horizontal <coughs> orientation to vertical, but still uh, quite uh, uh, complicated geometry. Uh, ironically, the smaller the slab area is, the more difficult it is to design because you not always have enough space to place all the right components of the form in place. Uh, so this, even though it was a small, relatively small slab, we spent more time on it, not more time on it, but significant amount of time designing it. Uh, River Pavilion, uh, this is a little bit of a, just overview, a picture overview. Uh, the most um, interesting geometrical uh, area of the river pavilion is this front wall, which would be similar to the front wall of Glissando wall. Um, and it was uh, uh, formed by placing a major, very strong, heavy duty brackets anchored in a pre on a straight uh, wall below that would support all of the forms above it. You can you can see it on this side right here, over of over on this side. So now uh, I'm going to move to uh, the the main uh, structure or the most difficult and the most interesting structure of this project, as far as the forming is concerned, is glissando wall that's been mentioned before, and. The main issue, obviously, is changing shape of this curvature. The curvature in here on the western corner is completely different from a curvature on this side. Uh, that's why we utilized, you know, 3D um, engineering department in Germany. Uh, what we had to get is we had to get 3D AutoCAD file for this wall. Otherwise, we there is no uh, 2D geometry that could be described uh, to uh, design the forms. The only, the only way to do it is to actually get a 3D file of this wall. And that's what we got. We got a 3D file from this, for this project and designed around this 3D file. And you, if you can see the amount of form work support that required for this wall. Let's go to the next slide and we will talk a little bit more about it. So this is kind of an overview of this wall. Uh, so this wall is, Glissando wall is approximately 144, 144 linear feet long. The wall thickness is 18 inches and lifts are 
just shy of 11, the first lift, 16 and 16. So the total of three lifts. Uh, obviously, it's continuously cha uh, changing shape. Coming from a, uh, this is the eastern part of, of the wall. This is the western part of the wall. And uh, what's, what was very challenging for this particular project is that the requirement was to use self-consolidated concrete. If you're not familiar with that, self-consolidated concrete means that we need to design form for full liquid head. And this is a big cost driver of formwork design, even without geometry problem. If it was a straight wall, it would be still a very expensive wall to form, but because geometry, it, was, it became even more expensive. I've been told that the white concrete cost is $1,000 per cubic yard. Uh, that's astronomical figure because it also was a white concrete and all kind of a chemical components that needed to be there to maintain the liquid uh, uh, component of the, uh, to maintain the liquidity of the concrete while uh, forming it. Now, to give you an example how uh, unreasonable uh, requirements were prior to what was actually agreed on, uh, we were originally considered or asked for the, to design the form using full liquid head for completely for full 42 high wall. Uh, so the complete height of the wall, including all three lifts, is about 42 feet. And if, if that was the case, it means that we would need to design the form that would withstand the pore pressure of 8,000 pound per square foot. Uh, Nobody had done it before. So we, you know, talked to the, to the customer and we convinced, and uh, we were very glad that we were convinced architect to agree, instructional engineer to agree to have a construction joints in here to reduce the concrete pore pressure. Uh, now also originally the, we were considering or we were required to design the form so that the concrete could be pumped from the bottom of the form. So imagine this 30, 42 linear feet high uh, formwork, formwork and it was, would be pumped from the bottom. And because of that, the, according to ACI, we need to increase the pore pressure by 25%. That's, we, that's why we get huge pore pressure at the bottom. Even if we have a 16 foot high pour and we need to create 25% pour pressure, that would be 3,000 pound uh, pressure. And it was a major, major problem as far as the design is concerned. Uh, we end up settling on 2100 PSF or 100 kilonewton per meter square, square because we did a mock up pours and figure out even there was a liquid head. Uh, we can assume at 1600 to be a 21 PSF. So the scheme was for this wall and also river pavilion, even though the river pavilion had only two lifts, is to set up external face, all three lifts in one time before they do the first pour. So all of these three panels sitting on top of each other were set up before they placed the first pour. And the reason for that is obviously is because there was, uh, we wanted to maintain the geometry, you know, to check geometry prior to the pores and uh, placing these panels all three pours at the same time, or, or three lifts at the same time prior to first pour was very important in order to verify geometry of the placement versus um, uh, as designed by architect. Because if we started to place this panel first, place this pour first, and later determined that the top of the form does not meet a location where it should be, then we would be in trouble. 
it is much better to make sure the geometry is set correctly and then pour one at a time. Now, this by itself caused a lot of problem for, uh, for this design is if we wanted to place all those forms at once, it's not just the pore pressure that we need to worry about, that we need to take care of. We need to take care of the wind pressures because the winds imposing on this form can uh, impose tremendous amount of load on this form even without the pore pressure. So this whole form, 144 linear feet, will act as a wing when the wind pressure applied and it can easily just fly off if there is enough wind uh, pressure on it. That's why we created design, a truss design, to, to maintain position of the forms and anchor it to the slab. I'll talk a little bit more about anchoring, but the, the principle of those drawings is visible on the slide. We pour the first lift, we set the second lift form on the shoring, we cross brace it to make sure that it's not moving anywhere. Then we um, do the play, place the third lift like this. This is an example of the south uh, east corner. It's the most difficult corner. It's the most difficult corner or piece of real estate I've ever seen that needed to be designed. Uh, if you notice, this is a tremendous uh, A-frame or truss that it needed to be designed uh, perpendicular to the corner and and along the corner. And the reason for that is that there is eccentric forces acting on those forms that do not normally act when it's a regular 90 degree corner uh, wall. Right here, we have a, a vertical wall coming in at, a, at acute angle to the sloping wall right here. And because of that, and because not we not always are able to alleviate pore pressure with ties, we have to uh, transfer the pore pressure, not just through the ties to the opposite form, but transfer pore pressure to the slab below. So all of so a lot, a, the pore pressure along the side of this corner was transferred using this brace to the slab below. Also, you can notice on the inside, this particular panel um, is a three-dimensional panel. Not only this is as difficult as it is to assemble and design, but this particular 3D design of this panel, uh, very labor, engineering labor intensive, because it not only have a wood as a gusset inside, it has a steel wellers inside that need to be accessed from inside outside of the panel in order to connect connect and disconnect ties where we could place the ties this is a picture of that initial the first uh, uh, lift panel and its perpendicular wall there's a little bit more uh, pictures in here uh, showing uh, setting up you see the crane hanging and setting up the panel of the third lift. And um, I believe uh, this part of the, the rest of the part already been poured. And this, this glissando wall was the last, last part to be poured. This is a little bit of a video. I don't know if you could be able to hear the video uh, there is there is no speech in here, so you can you can see a little bit of an overview of the building inside. And this is uh, a little bit of a video showing 
uh, I'm here at the top of the third lift, uh, and it, it gives you a little bit of a panoramic view of a job site. Now, special interest in this job was anchors, because like I explained it to me to you that this right here shown on the first lift form setting up, there will be three lifts like this on top of each other. So these anchors need to be placed, pre-placed uh, uh, in a slab. Uh, there's a many anchors. There's the anchor over here, the pair of anchors. There's the anchor over there. There's the anchor over there. And each of those uh, setups that's got two whalers in it have a different anchor at different locations. Uh, so all of it have to be preset exactly where they're supposed to be because there was, there was no possibility to pre uh, post install the anchor due to the fact that it is a voided slab. And there's a bubbles like uh, Sarah showed you, the bubbles in the, in the, Jeffrey showed you bubbles in the slab. That's how they were preset. Those are anchors are preset. And sometimes those anchors had to be preset at the location where the bubbles are. So the contractor just removed the bubbles. They removed the bubble from this area so that there is enough concrete strength developed to hold the anchor in place. And this is the, how the anchor was sticking out after the pour of the slab below. Uh, this is an example of the internal panel. This is one internal panel. Uh, as you can see, there's the openings in this panel, and you need to, uh, you're required to have those openings to access whalers are, that are inside in order to connect the ties. And obviously, because this panel is wedged between acute between walls at acute angle it is impossible to strip it so it, so what the contractor did they would destroy this panel after the pour there is no way of stripping it it's just one time use they destroy the panel and uh continue with the next next lift a uh, special load consideration had to be taken for this project because uh, because it's a variable shape uh, wall. The uh, if you imagine a body of liquid poured in this form, that that form will try to naturally assume rectangular position. So it will impose lateral loads on the form, not only concrete pressure directly perpendicular to the form, imposing, imposing load on the form, but it also impose a lateral pressure, try to straighten the wall. And those panels are gonna be in tension or compression, depending on which side of the wall they are, uh, thus be crushed against each other. That's why we had to design a tension compression system. Essentially what it is, it's a bunch of whalers running uh, on the side of the forms connected by um, uh, braces. And uh, uh, there is a quite, a, all of these whalers are custom made because so usually we don't have that kind of requirement on the regular walls, but because of the geomet geometrical shape, it creates pressures on the forms that forms are not supposed to take. So those whalers are taking the tension and compression from one end of the wall to another to relieve the lateral pressures on the, on the panels. 
and this shows a little bit of um, connections here, connections there. And on this picture, this is shown over here on the face. And on this picture, this is tension compression. That was cr critical, even though um, doesn't seem to me, but uh, the, the, the form would not be able to maintain the shape without the system if we poured it just using ties. Uh, another challenge, but mostly for a contractor, was obviously to place the board on the forms and later stripping the forms also would be challenge uh, without damaging the concrete. This is how would the uh, final product look like with a, with a board finish. It's pretty nice. Um, Sara already mentioned a problem with a tie. Uh, uh, the, because of the, the variable curvature, uh, tie almost never is perpendicular to the face of the form. And that creates spe a specific problems for this project. So we use this company in Germany that supplies uh, special tie cones that allow the tie to be not perpendicular to the surface of the form without creating issues with the cone. So this is a two-piece cone. This piece goes inside on top of this cone, and it can rotate, allowing this tie not only go perpendicular to the form, but, but on an angle to the form going through this hole right here. And we also created mold to place concrete to create the, um, the, the concrete cones that eventually go into the whole location. Also, the partially formed uh, glissando wall on the inside had to be braced because while they were setting up the form on inside for a third lift, uh, this wall is not able to support itself because it leaning inward, it would uh, fail probably. So that's why we had to place the temporary support for this wall. Uh, eventually this wall, after you pour this third lift and the slab on top, would be part of a structure that prevents this wall to collapse on itself. But meanwhile, in the process of construction, we had to um, uh, support the wall from inside. This is an example of assembly of the panels. Uh, this is an, one of the interesting panels in the corner. You see how many um, computer cut, CNC machine cut, uh, ply, uh, uh, plywood gussets they are. All those panels, like I said, is one-time use. As soon as they use them, we destroy them. Uh, the interesting way to connect those panels or to align one panel relative to another, each panel had a, a connector, looks like a tube, uh, that would slide into the opening of adjacent panel. Uh, we found out that it didn't work well that well, so occasionally we just removed it because the, the tolerance were such that slight uh, misplacement of this would negate any possibility of placing the, this connector into the opening of adjacent panel. So the last four of uh, on top of Glissando wall uh, happened March 15th, three years ago, big event big sigh of relief. Uh, there was a uh, difficulty stripping the form because the, the planking are connected to the form. So we needed to, we needed to, uh, a contract needed to strip the forms uh, without stripping the uh, planking. So it does, so, so it doesn't uh, damage the concrete. So it had to be done very, very, very gingerly. And uh, this is a view from inside. Uh, as you can see, it's not completely finished, but this is uh, 
view from inside. This is a final view without the plugs that um, placing the cones in the, in, in the hole plugs. There's a little bit more pictures of Clisanda wall. This is a river pavilion. River pavilion. This is entry pavilion. Uh, a little bit of information on the uh, effort for a 3D department alone. What was you said the curved curved walls and slab? It took 6,700 hours to design. This is a mock-up walls. They were so neatly done that a lot of tourists would stop by and look at it, thinking it's a it's an art. And we had a good laugh at it. This also, there were a lot of non 3D war, uh, uh, form work, essentially straight uh, wall form work. We spent about 4,800 hours on it. This is an example of the built uh, panels assembly. We spent about more than 10,000 hour, hour, hours on assembly of the panels. We uh, used a plastic cover on every panel to make sure that they not uh, get water on top of it and and expand. And this is it. Thank you very much for listening. Steve, I, I got to ask you, is that the most difficult form work you've been involved in? Uh, yes, it's pro it's, yes, for uh, more than 35 years of uh, experience, I haven't seen a more difficult job than this one. There were some difficult jobs, but not. They were usually one-dimensionally difficult jobs, meaning high pore pressure or difficult geometry, but not this one. This one was high pore pressure and difficult ge geometry. That's fantastic.